And welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Hey, it's great to have you with us. We have a returning guest today. I'll go to the preliminaries later on in the program. But right now, I'm going to jump right into my guest's uh, appearance here on the program again. She's returning to tell me your story, to share with us her latest, uh, her latest book that is coming out, uh, and uh, it is called Shift Calling. It is uh, a practical guide to accelerate your spiritual growth. Uh, Anna Gatman is my uh, special guest, returning for her second appearance here on Tell Me Your Story. It's great to have you with us uh, here as you uh, spend some time uh, living up uh, in Northern California. As you mentioned to me, uh, right near the redwoods of California. Yes, I have a small little, uh, the grove of all tr- of all trees, which is 15 minutes away. This beautiful oh. sanctuary of, um, and there's another one, there's a national park here. It's magnificent. Thank you for having me back on your show. And I'm really um, looking forward to us talking about um this really potent time in the evolution of human consciousness and um, why it's important to um, listen to the shifts that are screaming at us at this time and uh, accelerate our, sp- our spiritual growth in order to meet them, you know, with the, with, with um, the strength and the spiritual strength that we need in order to face them. Yeah, you you said it said it quite uh, accurately, and it, it and it's. Uh, I have I've had a number of people uh, depart this world in the last two years, um, as I and I basically I, I, for the most part I'm an open book on this program. Uh, I have lost my eldest sister a year ago March. I lost my father. This year, March, I lost my best friend of 53 years, uh, May 1st, uh, which was rather apropos considering the fact that he didn't attend either of my weddings uh, and uh, (laughs) but departed on the day, the date anyway, on which I was served what I came to find out was a lawsuit. My first set of divorce papers on May 1st, which gave a whole new meaning to the word May Day, the phrase May Day. Uh, But uh, um, we're all You're a busy guy <laughs> <laughs> to say the very least. And yet uh, you, you said it quite accurately that this is just, uh, you know, a, t- a period of time that we're, we're all facing and some of us choose to stay and kind of, as, as is said by one of my favorite satirists, Stan Freeberg, muddle through to victory uh, <laughs> in, in a, in, in a, in a manner of speaking. And there are those who have said to me on this program that from the other side, they're saying that we are all heroes because we have chosen to come into this world at this time. What are your thoughts in in regard to our choosing to be here during what seems to be uh, a very tumultuous time, very challenging? And yet, would I be wrong in saying that every generation has faced its challenges, its tumults? Or is ours different? I mean, every generation is born for its time. So we are born for these times. We are shocked by them. But I think that the agreement from the other side was that we are we we are coming in um, to support the transition of humanity to a more expansive, um, elevated consciousness that is more um, interdependent relational, connected to nature, um, connected to each other rather than destroying and killing and, you you know, really um, the raging wars that are going on at this time uh, are are, um, painful. And we have all the technology. We have the physical technology and we have the mental capabilities and technology and awareness to not have wars anymore and to resolve problems in different ways. So we are born for these times and um, we are the heroes. We are the heroes. Um, uh, Go ahead. I I was here. I I was just, I I wanted to ask you though, in that regard, I mean, you're right. So what's the problem? I mean, I can walk into any bookstore or library, find the self-help section 
in spite of what George Carlin says, self-help, why am I read somebody, reading somebody else's book if it's self-help? I'm supposed to be helping right. myself. But that aside, <laughs> you can walk into any any place where they have books and go to the self-help section and uh, you can read all about how to resolve and so forth. And yet, and yet, as you just stated, there are very there are numerous and some very uh, newsworthy, if you will, at least they're being made newsworthy, uh, events that are happening. And it's like, wait a minute, didn't you read this book or that book? Or right. what is your problem? Why can't you people get along? Um, what what's what's going on here? What's the problem? So first of all, I think maybe humbleness, respect, and patience are um are um are called for. And the reason I'm saying that because it's take billion it's taken billions of years of evolution for you know for the mineral world for the plant kingdom to arrive at the place that there is civilization here and life on planet earth mm. it has taken billions of years it's taking us time to evolve we need patience we need respect for the processes it's one thing to read a book. It reminds you. It awakens you. I mean, that's why I'm writing books, right? That's mm -hmm. why I wrote Shift Calling. I'm hoping people will read the book and it will awaken something. But I tell them in the book, this is not a weekend read. Mm -hmm. This is read a chapter. There's a question at the end. See if it fits you. If it's It, it, it is self-help. Does it fit you? Where does it fit the shifts that are calling you? And then practice it. If you don't practice it's not worthwhile. It's not yeah. worthwhile listening to somebody else's spiritual journey unless it inspires you. And it's just what you needed to hear in order to go, okay, now I know what to do next in my spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. And it is, it, it is taking years for us to evolve our consciousness and it is frustrating, but you can imagine how frustrating it is for God. You know, <laughs> right? Creating yeah. a Garden of Eden on planet Earth and humanity being the, the creative force on the planet. I mean, just think about it. Everything on this planet is created, has been created entire civilization from what grows above soil or within soil. That's it. Nothing's shipped in. So it's hard to see that when you hold an iPhone in your hand and you go, there's a lot of degrees of separation between what they call sometimes in America dirt and an iPhone. But guess what? It comes from what grows above soil or below soil. Mm -hmm. That is a miracle of creation. And we are a miracle of creation. And we need to remember that and to both to remember and to remember it, right? To put it together again. That is taking time and it's frustrating. It's frustrating when you see, oh, it's so easy. It's like, it's so easy. And apparently it's not that easy. It's taking yeah. that much time. Uh, apparently it isn't because if it were, we would have, uh, if you will, you, we would have accomplished that by now. Uh, I think right. that's probably an accurate way to put it. And yet- at the same time, for example, my father, uh, a year ago, the end of March, early part of April, I was there for my eldest sister's memorial. My father was watching on Zoom uh, because of his, uh, uh, his stability issues at the time. And I remember sitting in their home because I was staying with them uh, while I was uh, there for the memorial. And he made the ultimate statement that most parents make or others observing a parent's loss of a child. He says, you know, parents aren't supposed to bury their children. And it was at that. And I had nothing to I didn't respond to it because what do you say? There's nothing to say. Right. But what I got from that was and I it was confirmed by comments he had made to my mother after that. That he was done. Now, he yeah. was 91 at the time, 90 at the time. Hmm. And she told my mother told me this story very briefly. I'll tell you. Yeah. They were having a conversation and he said, I'm tired. I just I just want to go. Well, of course, my mother knows of his medical history. She knows how healthy he is. She said he had the blood pressure of a 20 year old. 
Mm. I said, I, I finally got my blood pressure back without meds. I was so excited. And she says, he said to her, he says, I just want to check out knowing how healthy he was. She says, okay, so what do you want to die of? Because, <laughs> and, and of course, what he ended up leaving this earth, uh, leaving the body that was then diagnosed five days before his passing, five days, they diagnosed him with both Parkinson's and onset dementia. Mm. And I think he just said, I'm going out like this because I, I just don't want to know any more about this world. He hated watching the news. Um, you know, even though he would try to keep up, you know, on what was going on, but for the most part, he just didn't like it. He, he, he wasn't really a fan of a lot of the music that was, uh, that was, um, that came along. I mean, you've heard, it's like the grumpy old man, get off my lawn kids, you know, kind of thing. You know, it wasn't quite yeah. that bad, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. we have a lot of people like that now. Yeah. But you're speaking to what you're speaking to is how powerful we are as creators. You know, mm -hmm. I'd like to go like that before my dementia kicks in. <laughs> I mean, just to go. My mother had dementia and she lived until 95. And um, it's interesting in the middle of severe dementia. You know, I told her, you know, I, I, I don't want to live that long. I prefer to go younger. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't say because I don't want to be in the situation that you're in and out of a dementia, she just says, that's what you're saying now. <laughs> yeah. Meaning if you grow older, you actually don't want to leave this world. But I want to speak, I want to connect it to something you said early on that that um, people who have transitioned to the other side say we are the heroes. And we are the heroes and it's connected to we are born for this time. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that... Um, what, what I have perceived, what I believe is that there is a great experiment happening on planet Earth. And the experiment is happening. So everything is consciousness, or take it back even a step further. Everything is energy in the world. Mm -hmm. But it's intelligent energy. That intelligent energy we call consciousness. Okay, well, before you go any further, yes. you're going to need you're going to need to define that word because uh for those of us even such as yourself who are observing and and so forth all that's going on you say there is an intelligence but then the question that i raise is is it really or or i guess maybe i want to go back to so where does it come from because it doesn't seem like on this planet there is too much intelligence going on based upon what we referred to earlier so can you define that uh, that term Right. So intelligence is not a, so. So humans have the capacity to reflect, to to reflect forward and backwards. Right. Mm -hmm. So to plan, to regret. Right. When I talk about consciousness, it's an intelligence. If you take water, the molecules that create water, there's an intelligence in there. There's an intelligence that creates. There's a form. So consciousness has a defined. It has. Um, it has a certain degree of density or fluidity. If it's completely fluid, it's in the non-physical world. The denser it is, the more it shows up in the incarnate material world. But everything, every cell, think about one cell in your body and all the functions that it does. There's an intelligence there. We're not talking about verbal intelligence. We're mm -hmm. talking about a defined consciousness a, an awareness of itself a capacity to produce you know miraculous wondrous things one cell can do not the billions of cells right so that's mm -hmm. even more that's what consciousness is okay and and and, and <laughs> consciousness so if you're talking about a cell has an awareness of itself of its sacredness Everything okay. that is conscious has an awareness of its sacredness. So water is sacred and the land is sacred and the plant kingdoms and everything that is consciousness is aware of its connection to source, to God, to light, to divine consciousness. 
that is consciousness. Does that make sense? Oh, I know yes. it's abstract things, but mm-hmm. and so he so here we are, and so there is the non-physical consciousness. You know, Deepak Chopra called this the, the field of pure potentiality, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's in order for something to manifest on the physical plane, it has to have an equivalent consciousness on the non-physical plane. And so everything on, on, on our earthly plane has a non-physical counterpart, an idea, a consciousness that in the ethereal world and beyond that in the spiritual realms that created it. Otherwise, it couldn't create because consciousness is what creates matter. So here we are. An experiment on planet Earth is can we come out of this connection to what to the wholeness to the sacredness to the wonder of creation can we leave the the non-physical realm and create matter which is individuated and separated without losing our connection to the non-physical the sacred the wondrous the miraculous that is the experiment and I'm sharing all of this because it connects to us being heroes. We are not the fallen ones. We are not the forsaken ones. Although I have felt fallen and forsaken many times <laughs> in my life, you know, yes. uh-huh. but the hero in me and the hero in you and in everyone is that we have chosen to come here in order to create this amazing garden of Eden here and evolve human consciousness so the so that this experiment of can I create something material without and, and for it to express the highest creative, wondrous, miraculous, can it have that expression? And so I'll give you like a simple example. If you go to a retreat center and you sit there, there's a bench, there's some water trickling, there's a sound, there's maybe there's a tree, some wind and You go, oh, this is beautiful. There is peacefulness here, Mm -hmm. right? There is tranquility here. That was designed on purpose, right? Right. They created the retreat center. They put that intention to have those qualities embedded in our material experience of this corner in the retreat center. It seems so obvious to us. Well, the same is we need to do that in everything else material. When you are doing a spreadsheet, If you're an accountant, and I Mm -hmm. talk about that in my first book as an example, if you come from a sacred place that you are, so so, so in a sense, you need to not just look at the material plane, but look at the hidden plane within the material plane and bring it out. So if you're an accountant, you're not just crunching numbers. You are creating stability in a company. You are creating order in a company. You are creating peacefulness. You are creating opportunity for more creativity or more growth or enough finances to take care of everybody in the company. These are all valuable um, sought after spiritual qualities. Mm. So you need to open the door to the hidden world within the material world in order to see all the gems that exist there, bring them out. And suddenly when you have a spreadsheet to do, you're not just crunching numbers and people going, oh, it's so boring to be an accountant. Oh my God, you're the peacemaker, the tranquility maker, the the, the ca- taking care of each other maker within the company. Now that's a sacred role. Mm-hmm. Your job is sacred mm-hmm. and everybody should treat you in this sacred way suddenly you have connected the spiritual with the material. You have unified it, cremate, you, you've cre- created a whole. That's the experiment of plant, on planet Earth, I believe, that we are here. And that's why we are heroes, because we show up into a material world, and the more dense um, consciousness is, so when it is material, the more the less connected it is to the to the spiritual non-physical consciousness from which it came so then we the creative force on this planet are here to imbue it with it and that's why there's evolution and it's taking a lot of time to remember that when i when i destroy the soil 
I'm destroying my habitat. I'm destroying the habitat that has allowed to create civilization. And when I kill my neighbor, I'm killing a human being. That is somebody's mother, son, daughter, father. Why would I want to do that to anybody else? It would be horrendous if it happened to me. Mm -hmm. Like your father didn't want to be here anymore. Why would I go? I'm, 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 I'm Israeli, born Israeli. So I'm close to the conflict that's going on now. Mm -hmm. And after the Hamas attack, the first thing that I felt Israel should have done and clearly is not there to do that would be to say, stop right now. This was horrendous. We have been through the Holocaust. We have been through centuries of anti-Semitism. Okay, you've frozen. All right. <clears throat> the forces at B didn't want us to talk about this, huh? Apparently not. Uh, stand by one second here. I sure. need to reorient Zoom. Yeah, it's uh, that's usually what it is. Uh, it's uh, it's some of the uh, some of that supernatural aspect that says, -uh, no, you don't. We'll give you a hard time. But um, I persevere and it just says, uh, yes, we will. And just because you did that, that means this is going to be even better. So what I'm going to ask you to do, I'll count you down. Start again with uh, your connection to the conflict in Israel in yeah. three, two, one. So I'm Israeli. So I'm very connected to um, the conflict that is going on now. And as I said earlier, it's like every child in the world is dear on all sides. And just like your father said, I don't want to be here anymore. A, a parent should not see their child transition before them. Yeah. I feel that the, the, the thing that I would have wished for, if we could jump, apropos what we talked about afterward, if we could do a leap of evolution of, uh, of consciousness of humanity, would be that Israel, after the horrendous attack of Hamas, would stop and say, okay, let's stop this. We have been through occupation for decades. We have been through the Holocaust that was horrendous. We have been through centuries of anti-Semitism. We want peace today. That's the leap. It's so simple to do and so hard to do. Mm -hmm. We want peace right now. We don't want another child to suffer what Israeli citizens suffered on the 7th of October. So peace now, whatever it takes. It is a complex conflict. There is colonialism, there is occupation, there is anti-Semitism, there is there is there's a there's so many layers there. But here we are right now. And we don't want a killing of another child to happen on either side. That would have been a miracle of evolution of human consciousness. And yet we're not there. No. We're, we're not there. And it is sad, painful, and horrific because these are real lives of people that yeah. are suffering. Lost this potential. Is not, yeah, yeah, yeah I've, lost I've, potential. Yeah. I mean, who knows what, and I don't know what the number is today as of our conversation. Yeah. Thousands, maybe. Uh, how do we know that we just haven't, eliminated the next Einstein or the next uh, Madame Curie or or whoever uh, by the same token how do we know we yeah. just didn't uh, annihilate the next Hitler or Osama or whatever by the way that's another that's another uh, conversation for another program in terms of knowing the truth knowing the reality the the true story of an individual and we yeah. just we don't have that and and we've laid laid all this stuff out and see that's another yeah. issue and you've you've raised this very well thank you so much uh for for bringing this up because my first thought after hearing of the retaliation was do you know how all of this ended up in history over the years every time you retaliate and 
I'm not I'm not uh, castigating yeah. either. I'm not castigating yeah. either side. They're both responsible for what's going on there. And, uh, you know, so I'm not I'm not taking sides here. I'm 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 with you. Yeah. And has this ever really worked? And someone said, well, of course it did, because we did this for 100 days or 100 right. hours, whatever it was. Right. And and then it was over. It's a, no, it wasn't. There's a beautiful song. I think it's beautiful. It's called The Green Fields of France. It's a beautiful Irish song about a young man walking. He comes across a cemetery and he uh, he's just he's, he's weary because I don't know where he's headed, but he comes across this cemetery and he finds this one uh, uh, gravestone of a young boy by the name of Willie McBride. By virtue of the gravestone, he died at the age of 19. And of course, this gentleman is uh, basically saying, so you were you were part of the Great War, were you? You know, did. And one of the verses basically speaks to what we're talking about. Did you think you and your comrades, you and your fellow soldiers, did you think that by joining the fight that you would end the war uh, to end all wars? Uh, well, and of course, the gentleman, again, speaking to the, 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 this uh, this young boy, said, don't worry, I'm not giving up. I'm going to tell you that right now. So I'll tell you when you froze for me, you froze for me when you said, when you started the story about the Irish, you you were, you know, you'll have to start right. it from, from the beginning if you I, do want to. I will do that in three, it. two, one. There's a beautiful song called uh, The Green Fields of France about World War I and a young man walking uh, through France, apparently, and uh, comes across a cemetery and a tombstone of a young boy by the name of Willie McBride. And according to the tombstone, he died at the age of 19. Well, one of the verses addresses the issue of the the war to end all wars. Did you think that you and your fellow soldiers, your the young men that joined you in right. this fight, yeah. uh, thought that you were going to uh, end the war to end all wars? Well, I hate to tell you this, and I've made, I personally, Richard Dugan here, I made this observation uh, not long ago. As long as we keep fighting, and this is where this young man's comments go to Willie, as long as we keep fighting, every war, every conflict that has ever been fought has been fought in vain. And until we stop fighting, uh, you know, and again, my heart goes out to the, the, the wounded and the lost servicemen of our country and any other country. But at the same time, if you look at it from that broader perspective, we're still fighting. You said it already. We have not come to the consciousness to say, let's do something different. And Einstein said it best. You cannot. And the way it's put, I think, is you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. Right. And that's really what we're doing right now, not just in terms of conflict, but in yeah. terms of religion, in terms of the uh, of economics, in terms of education, whatever you want to throw up there. We haven't uh, I've, I've heard it. Uh, I'd love your comment on this one. I've heard it said, Anna. We're we're not even crossing the threshold of the cave that we're trying to come out of. Yeah. You put it so beautifully. I think that's, <clears throat> sorry, exactly it. And I actually have that quote in the introduction of my book, Shift Calling. We need to, we cannot solve a problem from the same consciousness, the same mindset from which it was created. Because the definition of insanity, mm -hmm. <clears throat> sorry. That's all right. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing again and again and again and expect a different result. That's the definition of insanity. Yeah. Why is it insane? Because you're doing it from the same consciousness you did it before and expecting that something else will happen. Mm -hmm. You need to shift something. And that speaks to something in the book that I talk about, that one degree shift can change your life, your world, and our world. There's this, um, it's the 160 <laughs> airplane rule, something like that. Oh. Um it is if a pilot uh, 
shifts the plane by one degree, just one degree trajectory. That's very small, unnoticeable. But after 10 minutes, they'll be 60 miles away. They'll be further away from their destination. And if they continue for a few hours like this, they will end up in New York instead of in Chicago, just with one degree shift yeah. originally that wouldn't made any difference to begin with. So one degree shift, if we each do, compounded over time, you're going to end up in a different place. We're not yeah. talking huge shifts. One degree shift can change your life and your world. Yeah. And we're, so it, it also brings, yeah. yeah it, I was just going to tell our listeners, we're talking to Anna Gatman. Uh, she's sharing with us the work that she is, has done and the new book that she has out available. I'm going to allow her to continue. And again, my apologies for interrupting there. But she has this wonderful book called, what is it? Shift Calling, A Practical Guide to Accelerate Your Spiritual Growth. Uh, and I'm Richard Dugan, and you're listening to Tell Me Your Story. You're also listening to Dr. Anna Gatman. Uh, continue that thought in terms of yes. making that shift. Yes. I think the other thing to import, that is important, and, and, and it relates to the intensity of our times, that the more intense it gets outside in the world, the more we may feel like, well, I'm just one person. What can I do? But again, one degree shift mm -hmm. compounded over time can make a difference. Yeah. And the reason is we see ourselves as, as individual. You know, when, when we look at uh, the, the plant kingdom, if we look at an oak tree, we look at the species of oaks. They share a consciousness, which is why they're, you know, an intelligence, which is why they reproduce the same tree each time, right? Mm -hmm. There's an innate intelligence there. The same goes for anything. Well, us humans, we also share a consciousness. We have our individual consciousness. We have the consciousness that is created by our tribes or communities or cultures, countries, but there's also human consciousness and we are part of that. And so imagine an ocean of human consciousness and we are a drop in it, but we're also an ocean. And so one degree shift within that ocean is going to have a ripple effect. The waves of the ocean are going to shift. So when I make a change, when I shift my little life with my little problems, with my life circumstances, and I think, well, it's just me, I'm also affecting the ocean of human consciousness. And that's why we are the heroes, because at this time, when the, the, the shifts that are calling us are so loud, if we shift ourselves, make a change in our life, but see that we are part of, of humanity, then we are helping elevate humanity. Because as long as we stay in our own turmoil, we are just contributing to the suffering in the world. Mm. If we come out of our own suffering... We are not, and I've dealt with this issue, we are not betraying those who are suffering, which I have had to, dealt, to deal with myself. But we are actually elevating humanity, bringing more joy, more creativity, more abundance, more possibility, more everything to this human consciousness. And then the more of us do it, our own shift, our personal shift, but also being aware that we're doing world work. I, I, I say that our personal work is spiritual work because I see life as a spiritual practice. So personal mm -hmm. work is spiritual work and spiritual work is world work. Our personal work is world work. If we do it in that with that consciousness that we are elevating humanity, boy, do I want to start working on my issues now because I'm not just doing it for me, I'm doing it for humanity. Mm. You know, uh, it's interesting how, you know, you phrase it that way. We are working. I, I, I mean, you know, you talk about working on my yourself. I'm 63 years old. I started the real conscious work on myself back in the early 1980s. The first self-discovery uh, kind of program I went through was called LifeSpring. Part of, it was an outgrowth of EST from the seventies. 
Uh, it was different, but it was still one of those personal growth programs. And I've been through several others in the in the subsequent years into the 90s. And I've been still in the 21st century, still doing this. And it's like, when am I going to get to stop doing When do I finish the work? And the reality is you don't. I don't. I don't ever get to finish the work as long as I'm still here on the planet breathing. And that's you okay. You like that you said, yes, go ahead. Why is well, it okay? It's a, and it's like, it's like you said, you know, um, because as I change, and this is something significant, I think that you, you're going to dovetail off of, as I change, I change the world. Now, it may not seem like it. It may not. As one person out of uh, 8 billion plus individuals on the planet. But here's the what's interesting. You know the old saying, you can't change other people? Guess what? That's a lie. But you can't do it intentionally. It doesn't work when you do it intentionally. Uh, but when you change yourself... By working on yourself, you're either going to draw some of the people that are around you closer and draw new people to you and closer, and you're going to push away people who don't want to have anything to do with you because they think you're nuts. Yeah. Guess what? You've changed them. Yeah. Uh, Anna has changed me in this program. I have changed her. Because it's yeah. just sort of the, uh, I want to say the natural course of events, but actually I think it's on a higher level. It's more of a uh, uh, a supernatural or spiritual course of events. It's one of the laws of the universe. Yeah. Um, some, I think, have used the, what, the term, the butterfly effect? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know physics, you know, quantum physics is coming, is, 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 is finally, um, uh, what do you call it? Like like reaching or or uh, um, I lost the word for it, but it's finally coming together with what mystics have experienced throughout the ages, mm -hmm. right? So there is this butterfly effect because we are interdependent, right? And yes, if you see yourself, you, you cannot you cannot um, interfere with somebody else's soul journey with somebody else's agency but if you start seeing yourself as part of a larger field and you being part of that then you are affecting the field if you decide today to express the quality of let's say peacefulness Mm -hmm. Or it could be joy, but let's say peacefulness. I'm going to walk today with a sense of peacefulness in my heart, whatever I do. That's my commitment for today. And I imagine that I create like a bubble around myself of peacefulness inside me and around me. And as I walk, I'm wobbling with this bubble, okay, of peacefulness. And you can pick any quality that you want for the day. Now, wherever I go, I might go to the supermarket, I might go shopping to do some errands, I might go to work, I might have a meeting with my parents, my children, whatever you do. Mm -hmm. If you have that awareness, this expanded awareness that you are emanating peace today, you are changing the field where you're going to walk. Anyone walking into that field, if you decide that your bubble is... Um, I. I Then wherever you, as you walk around saying, I'm emanating that, then anyone walking into your field, standing closer to you, suddenly they've entered your field, right? So mm -hmm. you're effect, they're, they're affected, they'll choose to do with it what they want. But you are affecting the human field and you're affecting more closely the field of where you live, the land that you're on, the interactions that you have, the thoughts you have, the choices you make, the decisions you you take, and that affects the feel in a ripple effect. Yeah. And with the compounding principle, it it just it's the one degree shift can change our world, you know. And all of this that I'm giving you is just you know, 
I, there are principles in my book, like the expansive principle, you know, make yourself a large field. You know, I talk about that in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there, everything that I've shared with you are things that I'm talking about in my book. And I explain there, but that's how we have the power to affect the consciousness of humanity. And that's why I love the, 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 the name of your podcast because why are our stories important? Because they inspire others, they give hope, and they affect the field. Mm-hmm. You hear a story, you go, wow, they did it. Maybe I can do it too. You've affected the field. You've touched another human being. They'll do with it what they do it. They, they don't do what you think that they should do maybe, but they do their own thing. But just send your <laughs> blessings. People will take them. And you're affecting the field that way. So we are more powerful than we think that we are. Shift calling. (laughs) (laughs) It's a practical guide uh, to accelerate your spiritual growth. And I will tell you that on the one hand, on the one hand, uh, accelerating spiritual growth is absolutely a wonderful thing because uh, it means that we, we will, we will have a greater understanding of, uh, the big picture, at least as far as we can see it, you know, we can't really see the big picture, but we can certainly get a, a better glimpse of it as we move forward. And also uh, the big picture of our life and our existence. But on the other hand, you know, it's like, do do I really have to, do I really, do I really want to accelerate this? I mean, you know, the pace that I'm going now, it's pretty horrendous. I'm going through a lot of stuff, Anna. Uh, and, and, and I just, I, I need to slow it down. Matter of fact, uh, could you stop the world? I want to get off for a little while. Okay. <laughs> Just stop. And the reality is, and I, I kind of put it this way. I was working for a Christian radio station. I'd heard the stories over and over again. And I can only imagine what's being said out there in the religious world today over what's going on in Israel uh, in that part of the world and how they're tying it to book of revelations and the end of the world and the apocalypse and the second coming and the antichrist and so forth. I know they're doing that because they did it back in the eighties when I was working there. Hmm. And that story after about four or five years was like, you know, I've already read this book 500 times. Um, meaning you people just won't let this story go and you keep telling it over and over and over again. And it's getting boring. Is there anything I can do to accelerate the process, um, I'll even become the Antichrist uh, so that we can move on to something else because this story is so boring. You've been telling it for 2,000 years, maybe more. I don't know. Yeah. Um, maybe, and, and I'm not a believer in that scenario. Okay, yeah. don't get me wrong. I'm not a believer in that scenario. But doggone it. Um, there are times when I wish that we could reach that place where, I mean, I grew up watching the cartoon, the Jetsons. Are you familiar at all? Yes. And I'm going, oh man, the 21st century is <laughs> going to be so cool. I can hardly wait, you know, and I'm having to wait still. Uh, although they are, they are working on flying cars <laughs> <laughs> and all of that. Um, we're talking with Anna Gatman, and she's got this wonderful book that I just mentioned. She also has a second book that was actually her first, uh, Living a Spiritual Life in a Material World. You do know what song pops in my head every time I read that title. What? what? Material Girl in a Material, material World. Material Girl, Madonna. Okay. So just <laughs> so a shout out, that book, the second ex- expanded, revised, second edition of that book is coming out November 27th. So that's another whoa, thing. Whoa. 27 you're you're planning that far ahead wow november 27 <laughs> you 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 are you are no the wait, no 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 not the year 2027 november oh. 27 that's oh, coming up in oh, oh, three oh, weeks oh, oh. four weeks from oh, now i beg your pardon as of our conversation <laughs> folks okay i'm sorry yeah. i was thinking boy she's what an, optimistic, <laughs> what an optimistic woman she is that we're still going to be here we won't have blown ourselves up because right. that's kind of how it feels today yeah. is that you know ah I mean, I've even, uh, and again, I'm going to offer this suggestion to solve all of our problems on the planet with tongue in cheek. I, it's satire. I don't mean it. I'm not putting out that intention, Uh, but here is the ultimate solution to solve all of our problems. Every member of the family of nuclear sets off its bombs. We wipe out 
everybody on the planet. And guess what? No more problems. I but say that. We, yeah, but with but humor, then we, with LOL, right. LOL. Right. <laughs> okay. But then, but but then we will um, have failed at the experiment. Yeah. To create a sacred planet, sacred humanity, we, we would have failed at it. So yeah. we're 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 trying hard, and 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 there's efforts from the non-physical world as well. We are mm -hmm. collaborating with non-physical forces that are helping us whether we are aware of it or not. Talk to us about that because that's very important for people to get a, gra a, a grapple on that. I'm just one person. Yeah, I, I can't do this all by myself. Guess what? You're not alone. So, you know, we can, because, so, so if we see ourselves as individual, then it feels like we can only affect ourselves and maybe our immediate world. But if we see ourselves as a field of consciousness, humanity has a shared consciousness, then there's a wholeness to life. So then there's, there's the shared consciousness of humanity. Then there's the wholeness of create. There's the wholeness of, of the planetary wholeness, the consciousness of nature. Nature has consciousness. And so, and then in the non-physical, people who have transitions, angels, divic realm of, of the plant kingdom, different allies on the non-physical realm. All of this is part of the Gaian ecology. And if we work together, we can be more efficient and effective in affecting the whole versus just trying to change something inside of us you know, in, in based on the circumstances of our life, which is much harder. Mm. So it is time, you know, the, 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 the people that I study with, the lineages I come from, is all about collaborating with the non-physical realm together to change the um, ecology, the consciousness ecology of the planet and of humanity. And so we are not alone. It is much larger, much more. So here again, the expansive principle, which I talk about in, in my book, it is much larger than just us. And that's what we're trying to do here on planet Earth. Mm. But I want to go back to something else Okay. that you said earlier. I, I want to speak. I am no expert or scholar by any means uh, of, of Christ. And I know that, you know, it can be a sensitive topic. Sure. Um, um, and I, I, and again, I say that with, I don't mean any disrespect. I, I, it's, it's just my observation. So go ahead. So, but, but I, first of all, Christ was Jewish. <laughs> so I just want to yes, give him that and thank put you. that in, in that position. Mm -hmm. And in the tradition of that, he was, he was a man of um, great compassion, great compassion. And often that is what is connected to, we associated he was clearly a healer, but he was also fierce. He spoke truth to power. He defended the poor. So there was a fierceness in him as well that he stood up for. Mm -hmm. And this is the time to have all these qualities, the Christ consciousness, the fierceness of heart to stand up for what is right. Mm -hmm the compassion for the other as if it was my own because it is my own. It's all of those. And, and then the healing comes from that. Mm. So I feel that it, there's also a shift in, 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 in seeing that it's not just about compassion. It is also about standing up. I think that the one question, you know, when I thought of the Israeli Palestinian conflicts. And I was specifically thinking about the Israeli government because prior to the, the latest events, Israel for the, the past 10 months or so has been going through trying to um, change the government uh, with demonstration, weekly demonstrations because their government is so corrupt. And so I thought to myself, what is, you know, like, what is the meta? There's so much coming at us. What mm -hmm. is like one simple thing Give me simplicity. I can't handle the complexity and I can't be told <laughs> we can't fix it. It's so complicated. We can't fix it. It's to you don't understand. Stay in your own lane. You it's too complicated. <laughs> okay. So 
I went inwards and I asked myself, what is one thing? I, I need just, I just need one question. What can I ask myself? What can be my guiding light? And what came to me is to just the, the, the highest level is to ask myself, am I losing my humanity with the thoughts I'm having, the actions I'm taking, the decisions I'm making, or am I keeping my humanity, sustaining it, amplifying it? Mm. That is a key question, because if you ask that question with everything you do, I mean, that question in itself is enough for you to grow spiritually, to accelerate your spiritual growth. Am I being, am, am I losing my humanity when I'm taking this mm. side or that side in a conflict? Am I losing my humanity the way I'm talking to my colleague? Or am I bringing out the best in me? The best of what it means to be human, a spiritual human and an incarnate human. You, that is you, a, a question to ask. Yeah. And you have raised a very interesting point I want to dovetail off of. Um, it has been said uh, by a dear friend of mine. She is an intuitive. Um, she also sees auras. And she was sharing, and this goes back like 14, 15, 16 years ago when I was producing her program. And she said, when you look around on the earth and you see the turmoil going on, whether it's mother nature, as we like to refer to her, uh, with hurricanes and tornadoes and flooding and maybe even wildfires and earthquakes and whatever, whatever you want to throw in there, yeah. mix that in with man's inhumanity to man. She says, the first thing you want to do, and you kind of, you alluded to this. She says, you want to turn within and ask yourself the question, what part of my life is in turmoil? Because mm -hmm. these events reflect what's going on inside of each and in each individual human being. It kind of goes to the, the phrase, I, I want to say it's either pagan or Wiccan. I can't forget which, maybe it's somewhere else. As above, so below. As a below, so above. Yeah. And you really touched upon a, a very important point, I think, that requires some self-analysis, if you will, uh, introspection, reflection, especially when we do what you just talked about, for example, taking sides. I, I don't, I'm not taking sides on this this business up in Ukraine, although there was at one point uh, I was saying if I had the wherewithal, I would be buying a ticket to Moscow, flying to Moscow, telling the uh, uh, security, get the heck out of my way, going into the Kremlin, going up to that little guy, grabbing him by the ear and would say, your mother would be ashamed of you. We don't play like this in the 21st century. You need to stop this and stop it now. Yeah. OK, I don't care yeah. who started it. You know, I don't care if it was you or if it was them. You, the only way something stops is if somebody stops and it yeah. has to start with you and whoever you think you are. It starts with you. The same yeah. thing with Israel and, and Hamas. Yeah, It's got to stop. Yeah. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. <laughs> It's it's yeah. frustrating, though, because yeah. you and I, we're seeing it. We uh, somehow you and I are able to see yeah. the, the situation. And it's so, like, what is wrong with these other people? How is it that they're not so, seeing so, it? So so here it is. You know, you speak to it, 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 it. You said before, like, how many years do I still need to do the work? It's like, yeah. have I not worked enough? And I've asked myself yeah. many, many times, even <laughs> as I was writing, even if I, as I was writing my book, Shift Calling last year. My mother was transitioning to the other side. And as I was experiencing anticipatory grief and writing personal stories, which I write in, in the first part of the book, I'm, I share my own shifts in my life and the, the big shifts that I've gone through. I was going through a lot of grieving. Um, and I was going like, I was going to focus and write for six months and instead I'm sitting and sobbing and, and looking at my alcoholic mother, my raging father, my stutter, like many things that I had as a childhood that I went through. Mm -hmm. And what I've come to realize is that my body, my being is transforming 
me, but also the field of humanity. And that's why it's endless. Mm. It's endless. It's not like, oh my God, I, I like I'm not healed yet. I'm still broken. There's another piece of work. There's another layer in order to clean the, the field. And that's why it's so intense. Now I'm I'm looking at, and that's something that your listeners can also do. It's like every event that's happening, look at it either as a cleaning, like the the um the shit hits the fan, the shift hits the fan, the opportunity for a shift is hitting the fan. Look at it as what is it trying to tell me? Mm-hmm. What do I need to learn from this? This is happening because of a reason. It's a, it's a result of something that has made it come to the surface. And so it's not happening to us. It is a mirror of different things mm-hmm. in our personal life when it happens directly to us or in the world. And what can we do different? What is the learning here? And when we change ourselves, like you said before, if we change our consciousness, if we change our relationship to nature, to soil, to the elements, to trees, and see them as sacred beings in a relationship with us, we breathe in oxygen. We omit CO2, which sustains trees. Trees do photosynthesis, and they omit oxygen, which we need. That is a sacred bond with trees. So how can we just take trees down without any regeneration or without the sacred bond, acknowledging the sacred bond we have with the plant kingdom? Yeah. When we change our consciousness internally, each one of us, it will change. And so it's to your point what your colleague said, the conflict is inside us. Mm -hmm. When we shift our consciousness, like Einstein said, about everything, it will change the field of humanity and the external results will also shift. And so don't feel bad, like, yeah, but I'm not as aggressive as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or Mm -hmm. I am not as whatever Mm -hmm. you see something out there you see evil as if it's there we are all human we share those there are dire situations in which we would also kill that we would also do the lowest of lowest we have in our past we do we have in our fights and we there are things that we all regret that we could have done differently so we all have it in us Mm -hmm. and ask ourselves where does this conflict show up in me Where do I not say stop? Can we be peaceful now? And why not? And understand why not? Because it's really hard when you hurt. Mm -hmm. It's hard to stop. All you want to do is to be vengeful. You just want to give that other person, you want to wound them so that they feel how much you're you're hurting. That's what we want to do. And we need to be honest about that. Yeah. So can I at the moment when it hurts the most to say, Okay, I'm going to hurt them. They'll hurt me. Okay, we'll divorce in six months. We're divorced. Well, okay, stop. It takes a lot of vulnerability and courage to not do the reactive thing. So it's easy to blame conflicts out there, but how hard, how how easy is it for you? How easy is it for me? How hard is it to not be reactive and to do something differently from a different place? That's the evolution. Yeah. And it, and, and, and it ain't easy for an individual. So how should it be easy to try to do it with an entire country? Exactly. I mean, and, and the, 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 the population uh, uh, between Israel and Palestine is minuscule by comparison to some of the other larger countries like China and Russia and India. And it doesn't, it, it's not the size that I think that's something that, that we've gotten attached to it sort it almost uh, uh uh leans into uh your your uh, first book uh, living in a spiritual uh living a spiritual life in a material world it isn't about the numbers i've often said this uh, anna that um we all experience 
the same emotions, different, different intensities, but they're still all the same. What makes us unique, not different, but unique is the stories. And we need to listen to the stories. I remember there was a survey taken actually in Israel, of all places in Israel, this survey was taken by, uh, I don't know who it was taken by, but it was of the young people at that time. Maybe this was 20 years ago. And the survey results basically said this, that the young people do not want to have anything to do with the conflict that their parents are always talking about between them and the Palestinians mm -hmm. or Hamas or whatever other group, yeah. you know, yeah. hates them. They want to go on to do other things things. It's kind of where I was coming from back in yeah. the 80s with the whole Christian end of the world story. Yeah. Uh, I don't want any part of that. I want to move on to bigger and better things that are of a positive nature, which is what this program is all about. Dr. Yeah. Anna, Dr. Anna uh, Gatman is my guest here on the program. And we are talking about Shift Calling, a practical guide to accelerate your spiritual journey here on Tell Me Your Story. Um, talk to us a little bit about your perspective on that in terms of um, maybe the young people. And I, if you, I don't know if you ever heard of that survey or anything like it, but I'm, I'm thinking that even the kids, uh, and I, when I say kids, I'm 63, so anybody younger, I guess now, is a kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they don't care about the things that their parents care about today yeah. um like uh inflation what, what inflation what are you talking about you know prices are what they are and if i want it i'll yeah. find a way to get it you know uh the environment well you know i'm doing my part and i can only do a little and uh it doesn't matter whether china is doing their part or not it's irrelevant i'm going to do my part okay and so on and so on they they there's a different mindset and I'm not saying that it's necessarily perfect, but it, heck it's different and, and, and so forth. So what are your yeah. thoughts in that regard to the younger generation and your observations? So I'm so, so, you know, there, there always has been, and there always are people who are more self-concerned with their own career or whatever they do and people who are more conscientious, but I, my experiences, um, and, and unfortunately I don't remember the name of that movie, uh, it's on uh, Netflix, but it's about the young generation in the U.S. And I feel that the young, they're, they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. They're seeing the world that they're about to inherit. I'm 63 too. Like, okay, we have another tw tw 20 year, 25 years maybe, and then we're gone. They have to live and maybe bring children into this world that is going to get much worse before it gets better because mm -hmm. our consciousness is evolving so slowly. Yeah. And so I find that the younger generation is very conscientious, very involved, and they're beginning to see, they know that the world is interdependent. They know without knowing about the butterfly effect, they see that what's happening in one side of the world is affecting us all. We saw COVID, you know, mm -hmm. that was the first time humanity had was sharing humanity, entire humanity sharing a common event mm -hmm. that's huge for the evolution of human consciousness. And I write about that in the introduction of my book, because that's, it was the, the, the gift in disguise of a curse was to start seeing ourselves as one human consciousness rather than just individuals, everything we're affecting each other. And so I'm finding that the young generation is much more concerned, concerned with bringing kids into this world, concerned about their, it, it's very hard to, 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 uh, on one job in the U S unless maybe you have a high paying white collar job, but right. it, it's very high. It's very challenging to pay rent and live a decent life as a young person in the United States and could be in other countries like that as well. Mm -hmm. And so I find them to be very concerned. That is my experience um, mm -hmm. with with the people, with the kids that I see. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to speak about is something you also spoke about earlier. Um, we can sit and watch the news, and every week there's a disaster, human disaster or natural one. Mm -hmm. 
and feel more and more anxious. That's the choice. Because you said earlier, why do I want to change? Why do I need to do? I just want to do my own thing. So we can watch the news and we can get more and more anxious and our breath can get more shallow and we can be more constricted and feel that, you know, it's the end of the world. That's a choice. The way out of the state is to practice the expansive principle, is to pierce through this into a new world, a new reality. So what does the expansive principle mean? It means on a body level, just start breathing deeper, create more spaciousness in your body. Suddenly your muscles feel more spaciousness. Suddenly your mind feels more spaciousness. Your heart opens. So, so you've done that. You don't want to do it. It's too much hard work. Don't do it. Stay anxious. <laughs> but there is a way out only on the physical realm. Just breathe deeply. Go for a walk in nature. Mm -hmm. Go on YouTube and look at a creek, you know, coming down and the sound of water. Go and on Google the, the, the great redwoods of Northern California and look at the pictures and see how small people are and how big they are. Just walk into the picture and just walk among, in your imagination. Walk through the redwoods. Expand your thinking, expand your heart, expand your energy, expand your breath. You're going to, within minutes, mm -hmm. you're not going to be anxious anymore. Yeah, it's amazing. Dr. Anna Gatman is, yes. Gatman is my guest. Um, uh, we're uh, rapidly uh, coming to the close of this program. I still have one final question I do want to ask you, but I have those three final questions I ask all of my guests. So I'll ask this real quick. How has your ability to speak at least, at least as of what, what I read, three different languages helped you to better observe and understand much of what you are uh, sharing with us here on this program in terms of the shift. Yeah. So first of all, I speak four languages. Now it's four. Okay. <laughs> I speak Hebrew, Swedish, because my, my mom was Swedish, Hebrew, Swedish, English, and French. Ah. Um. So, you know, I think that my life circumstances, which were not easy uh, emotionally as a child, but speak, uh, growing up with three languages and then learning French when I lived uh, in, in France and worked as a fashion model there, um, allowed me to see situations from different perspectives. So when I speak Hebrew, there's the humor, there's the mentality, there's all of that. That's a very different, you know, it's a consciousness, a complete consciousness. When I step into English, I become a different person. There's a saying that language defines consciousness. And so I speak English. I have a different way of relating to the world. Then I go to France and I start to speak French and I get the French humor and the French way of speaking. So these three and then four languages have allowed me to see the world from different perspectives. So I have a more expansive view. And I think that plus many other experiences of, of experiencing extremities in my life, which has been my circumstances, has allowed me to, I've been forced to see the world, not just from my perspective, but to experience it from an opposite perspective. It was hard as a child to live the extremities, but as an adult, I've learned to transcend and to see both parts or all three parts. And so mm -hmm. it's been very useful in that sense. Well, I am glad that you're here with us today to talk about this and to uh, expound on it. It's very important that we do just that. We need to talk about it. It's one of the reasons why I... Uh, it sounds strange. We lost a lot of human lives uh, during the, uh, the, the... While it was declared a pandemic, the COVID uh, or coronavirus yeah. pandemic. Yeah. But at the same time, it opened a door that needed to be open for decades. Uh, talking now about the second pandemic, the mental health and wellness pandemic. Yes. And we're talking about it. Um, if, uh, those of you listening, raise your hand if you're in therapy. And let me tell you, if you're not seeing a therapist, 
then you have someone in your life that you can go to and you can kind of talk maybe over a cup of coffee or something and you get to at least get that stuff out. We need to be doing that because when yeah. we hold it in, it it destroys us. It does. It does it slowly. Yeah. Let me tell you. Uh, Anna, thank you again so much. Uh, I do have those three final questions. And by the way, folks, I did say I was going to mention the preliminaries. Well, guess what? With this program, we're going to do a new thing. We're going to have that at the front and back end of the uh, programs that we won't put into the interview so we can put all of the time that we have into talking with our guests, such as uh, Dr. Anna Gatman. And to that, the first of those three questions is, who is Anna Gatman? Who is? Who is Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You can't put me on the spot like this. <laughs> OK, Anna Gatman is Anna Gatman is a um, a woman of contradictions, a spiritual being. A, a, a Oh, my God. What do I say? I am. Who is Anna Gatman? A fiery person who cares dearly about our planet and the world and humanity and wants to um, do good in the world and help other people do good in the world. That's who I am. What is your life's purpose? <laughs> I just said my life's purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so my life's, so my life's purpose is to, so I, I, I received a message from the non-physical realm, which I have in my book as well, where it says, where my inner guides tell me, we've showed you the kingdom, now claim it and share it with others. Mm -hmm. And so share it with others is one of my life purposes, but claim it is also because I think we need to enjoy the material world. Enjoy because the material world is other people's creativity, ingenuity, and life purpose. It's not just material things. Most of the things that you consume um, use somebody put their heart and their heart were that there's their sweat and their heart their love into creating it and mm. so the material world is alive with people's purpose people's creativity people's ingenuity and part of who i am to answer the first questions i love enjoying the material world because i'm enjoying human creativity as i'm consuming and i'm saying consuming as taking in the hidden world of the material world. Mm. So not just consumerism, but enjoying the creative force in the hidden world of something that's material. Mm. That's part of who I am. All right. My final question. I I hope that you, uh, you get the movie reference and I preface it every time because some people, they don't quite understand. Where did that come from? What was your best day? Oh, my best. I thought, and <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> what was my best day? Wow. Here is what I'm going to answer. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it by a story. I was asked once, what is my favorite meal? And other people said something from their childhood that they love. And, and I said, the meal I haven't had yet. Hmm. And it is true. I've had many, like, how could I say what's my favorite meal? Depending on my mood, there are different things. Sometimes I like to be nourished with something from my childhood. And sometimes I like to go to a restaurant. It's like, so my favorite day would be the day I haven't had yet. Wonderful. Well, Anna, I thank you again, Dr. Anna Gatman, for joining us here on the program. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again in the near future to, uh, to look back on what we talked about in this and the previous interview and say, okay, there is some sign of, there are some signs of uh, evolution of shift. Uh, and that uh, you just, we all just need to, we just need to be patient. Okay. Calm down. It's going to happen. Okay. Uh, because that is, uh, I, and I wish I had more time to ask you about this uh, in terms of, uh, the divine right order of things. But I'll tell you what, we'll save that for the next time. Okay. Thank you it again will happen, for joining us. It will happen when we participate because we are the ones, the heroes to make it happen. Yeah. So thank you. It was such a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you. And I, I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, video cast, love to lol. Jeanette, I am still listening. Dad.
continue to be happy because I am. To my dear friend Smokey, hey, I'll see you on the other side. And to my dear friend Zorro, aho, aho. <laughs>